McQuestion, talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuestion is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation for the Study of Teaching and Self-Government, the Meadows Foundation, serving the people of Dallas, Collin County Business Press, locally relevant, personally profitable, and Sundown Ranch, one sundown at a time. Well, hello from Las Vegas. I'm Dennis McQuistion, and we're here at Freedom Fest again in 2009 in July. And we've been talking about and listening to all kinds of interesting people talking about free market ideas, the, the credit crisis, and all those things. And I'm joined with, by two of those people right now. First is Doug Casey. Doug Casey, uh, Doug, you and I met, I don't know how many years ago, but I've sort of followed you around the world as you spend your time in New Zealand, Argentina, and the United States, and traveling all over. You're an investor. Uh, a guy, but uh, you've written a lot of investment stuff. You've written all kinds of things. Uh, one of the most interesting thinkers, and shall we say, out of the box thinkers. So, welcome to the program. Thanks, Dennis. And sitting next to him is Tom Woods. Tom Woods has written uh, one of the favorite books of mine that I've read recently called Meltdown, a free market look at why the stock market collapsed, the economy tanked, and government bailouts will make things worse. And so, Tom's obviously an economist and with the Mises Institute in Auburn. Alabama. Tom, welcome to the program. Thank you, Dennis. Now, Doug, I'm going to ask you to start because we're, we're really talking about this issue during this session. That is, is limited government an oxymoron? So tell us about limited government and then what the ultimate limited government is in your estimation. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I uh, am not a fan of government in principle. I don't feel that the institution, as radical as this may sound, is necessary. There are two ways people can relate to each other, voluntarily or coercively. And as Mao Te Tung pointed out, government comes out of the barrel of a gun. So I don't approve of government in principle. And I don't think that it's uh, either salubrious or necessary in today's society. Anything that needs to be done will be done by entrepreneurs. You don't need the dead hand of the state on the market. Yeah, but, but Doug, look, look, look. Here's the situation. I mean, you, you're talking about anarchy, and you're talking about a situation where it would seem to me without government, then it would be whichever private person or private group had the biggest set of private guns, and they could run over anybody else and get what they wanted. Why, why don't we need government to get in the way of something like that? Well, the situation you just described is exactly what we have with government. Uh, the government's got the guns and it's controlling everybody else. Look, uh, in, a, in a civil society, government, <clears throat> perhaps, you can make an argument, should do three things. Since government is force and coercion, it should protect you from force within its bailiwick, police, protect you from force with outside its bailiwick, an army, and pr supply a court system so you can adjudicate disputes without resorting to force. And if we had a society like that, I could... Even I'd you be, could sign off on I'd, that. I'd be all right. I could live with it. Unfortunately, those three functions are so important to the running of a civil society, they can't be trusted to the kind of people that inevitably go into government, who tend to be busybodies and power mongers. And always, always, this is the problem with limited government, is it tends to grow like a cancer over time. And uh, as evidence, I offer you the history of the United States itself. Uh, no, I don't think that government, uh, as shocking as this is to say, serves a useful purpose. It's, it's not really necessary. OK, Tom, now you've heard this, um, shall we say, off the wall stuff. Where are you on limited government or anarchy? Well, Dennis, I, you know, for years I was one of these people. We got to return to what the founding fathers thought. We got to get back to the Tenth Amendment. We got to return to the Constitution. And you know, as the years go on, and you see that, you you observe this government and how utterly removed it is from the government we were intended to have. After a while, you start wondering, you know, look at all these think tanks sending out 
direct mail fundraising appeals. We've got to cut wasteful government spending, and nothing ever happens, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You wonder, maybe I am chasing a unicorn here. Maybe there is no such thing. Maybe if you say, this institution has a monopoly on the power to tax and a monopoly on the power to initiate violence, but it will simply restrain itself to a few it's a few itemized tasks. I mean, it seems to me unrealistic. Moreover, I, I think there's a moral question here. If we're going to believe that there are certain moral principles everybody has to observe, why are those moral principles abandoned when we apply them to government? So, for example, uh, you and I can't steal. The government can steal and call it taxation. You and I can't kidnap people. The government can kidnap people and call it military conscription. And it just goes on and on and on. If we believe in in absolute standards of morality, the government always fails. So I fall not on the bomb-throwing side of you know, left-wing silliness on this issue, but I, I follow uh, Murray Rothbard, and, and anybody who is intrigued by this or thinks, you know, heavens, wow, an, a forbidden thought. I, heaven forbid we can't have this on the airwaves. I would recommend going to Google and reading an essay by Rothbard called Anatomy of the State. You'll never look at the world the same way again. Wow. And, and, and let me add, uh, you, you use the term anarchy, <clears throat> which I'm very comfortable with, but most people uh, say horrors. We can't have anarchy. That means chaos. And I would say, no, anarchy is actually the opposite of chaos. What we have today in society is a type of controlled chaos, if you would. And an anarchist doesn't mean a guy running around with a black cape with a little round bomb looking to destroy things. Sure, you have violent anarchists, just like you have violent dentists, uh, violent Christians, uh, violent shoe salesmen, but it has nothing to do with the essence of anarchy. An anarchist is simply one, uh, one who believes that uh, every person should control his, his self and not be ordered by some coercive power on top. Well, it's interesting. Um, you guys may have read this pamphlet that Mark Skousen, uh, Mark Skousen, by the way, for those of you who don't know him, is an economist who is sort of the <coughs> guy who runs Freedom Fest out here every year. He wrote a pamphlet called uh, Force or Persuasion, I think, or Persuasion or Force. I'm not sure exactly what he, what he said in one of the two. But, Doug, what he said in that pamphlet was <coughs> is that the, the more government you have, the more society is failing because you, you need more coercion. You, need, you get more. Do you, do you, do you, does that thought resonate with you at all? Oh, that's completely correct. Uh, the essence of government is force and coercion. And as Tacitus uh, said in the second century, uh, the more numerous the laws, the more corrupt the society. And this is, of course, why the United States has become more corrupt over the years, as we have so many laws which allow officials in power to dispense favors arbitrarily as they will and, and uh, collect bribes for dispensing these favors and so forth. Uh, no, the institution of government itself is corrupt and corrupting and unnecessary in, today, in, in an advanced society. In fact, in primitive days, it might have been possible was never moral, never ethical, but it might have been possible for the king in a primitive society to say, well, you take that ox, ox cart and you charge so much for your wheat and so forth, because it was simple, and uh, perhaps a simple society could be directed. But today, with billions of transactions every day by billions of people, it, it, it's not only immoral, but it's uh, it, technically impossible for the government to try to direct these things. <coughs> well, you mentioned that technically impossible, uh, first, uh, uh, Tom, I'd like you to tell our viewers who Friedrich Hayek was, as an example. And then he wrote a paper, I think it was about 1945, about knowledge and, and how it's just impossible for any one person or small group of people to know enough to make all these decisions for everybody else. Well, Hayek belongs to a school of economic thought called the Austrian School of Economics. He won the Nobel Prize in 1974 for his work on central banking and how it screws up economies. So uh, another example of how we don't need these institutions. But Hayek's essay on the use of knowledge in society was based on the idea that there's no, it's impossible for any one human mind to amass all the knowledge that would be necessary if you wanted to centrally plan society. Everybody's got his own localized knowledge. He knows that if I take this truck route, even though technically it may be 
longer in, a, in an extensive sense. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's more efficient to go this way. There's no way a central planner could know that. We've all got a lot of implicit knowledge that we just sort of know instinctively. We, we wouldn't even know to verbalize. And so, in other words, if you were to make any sense whatsoever of the productive structure and try to give it some rational direction, you wouldn't know where to begin. It would be impossible to be the height of hubris to think you could substitute your judgments for the judgments of hundreds of millions or billions of people who actually have the relevant knowledge necessary. Uh, Doug, I, I was um, debating a lady in Irving, Texas over 25 years ago on a, on a, a topic of mass transit actually and, and, uh, and she was convinced that we ought to have government running transit and so you can imagine where that went. But I ask her, as I've asked a lot of people, and I would ask that viewer to think about this right now too, and that is, what is government designed to do? And, and, and how would you define government? You defined it with those three ways a minute ago. But I asked her that question, and here's what she told me. She said, well, Dennis, um, government is that entity where we all just sort of sit around as a society and figure out what we can do for each other. That's how she answered that. What would you say to that? Oh, I would say that that's ridiculous and naive. Uh, look, uh, government, uh, even, or I should say especially, uh, the type that everybody believes in today, uh, democracy. Democracy is really just mob rule dressed up in a sports coat uh, to be polite looking. Uh, and I don't believe in mob rule. The best type of democracy and government is the market. You vote for what you want with your dollars and with your time, and if you don't want something, you don't vote for it with your time and your dollars. And that's the best type of uh, participatory democracy there is. And I can believe in, in, in uh, uh, th that's the way that people should relate. The problem with government that these people don't want to acknowledge and understand is that its main products are wars, pogroms, <coughs> confiscations, regulations, taxations, uh, all the worst things in the world. It produces nothing, and anything that it gives to one group is inevitably stolen from another group because government doesn't produce anything. It only redistributes things that it, in effect, steals from the producers. Yeah, but look, uh, Tom, we, we, you know, we, we, we have to have a safety net. I mean, there are people in society who uh, either because of faults of their own or no fault of their own. Uh, they need an income, they need, maybe they're sick, maybe they are uh, have a, a medical problem, that sort of thing. Uh, would you just throw those people out on the street? Is that what your idea would be? Well, if we had a society in which we didn't have this parasitic entity that sucks the life out of actual producers, people whose terrible crime is to add value to society, first of all, the society would be, what, three, four, five times wealthier than, than, than it is right now. Think of where in the world you would most like to be poor. Would you like to be poor in the United States, or would you like to be poor in North Korea? Or would you like to be poor in Bangladesh? Look at the societies on Earth where the poor are doing the best, and it is consistently the, the societies that have the most economic freedom. Now, in terms of, of uh, w welfare state, well, there's been an awful lot of sociological research on this that shows that actually these programs have, in fact, entrenched problems they were allegedly intended to solve. But that what, in fact, they do is they make people dependent on the state. This is just the type of relationship the state likes to have with people. But look back to the 1960s before medicine was, was so heavily bureaucratized. Are we reading in the newspaper that p people are dying in the streets and we're walking over corpses on our way to work because they can't get medical care? You find that the poor and the wealthy had about the same number of hospital visits. Costs were reasonable. Physicians understood that part of the moral obligation they had as physicians was to give free or low-cost medical care to people. I mean, this sounds like a, a society from Mars, right? Whereas today, we have this gargantuan regulatory mess, and we think this is what free market medicine causes. So I would say that the private productive sector and the voluntary sector can take care of these people, and your local parish would take care of these people rather than let them, let them starve. But these gigantic budgets, like the New York welfare budget, has consistently 70% of it goes to overhead. 
So it's not even as if you would have to replace dollar for dollar what the government is doing. And moreover, if you look at in the 60s when people were, were learning that the government is waging a war on poverty and you look at voluntary giving, it goes right down, right down. Then you look in the 1980s when welfare spending was actually increasing, contrary to popular belief, just increasing more slowly. It was still growing, but people were under the impression that it was being cut mercilessly. But then you look at charitable giving, it's exploding during the alleged decade of greed. Interesting. Now, uh, Doug, I would imagine that he mentioned the health care issue. Um, as it relates to government, this idea that Obama is floating now uh, about totally uh, changing the health care system. I was briefed by his top economist uh, for the Society of International Business Fellows when I was in D.C. 60 days ago. And here's what the economist told us. He said, first of all, we're going to make uh, health insurance available to all the 45 or 48 million who are uninsured. Secondly, we're going to increase the quality of health care. And third, we're going to lower its cost. What are the chances of those three things happening? Slim and uh, none. And Slim's out of town. Uh, no, it's, it's, it, it, it's not going to happen. Look, uh, it used to be <clears throat> that people treated paying somebody to take care of their body much the way they treat them to take care of their car. You put some money aside so in case your body breaks, just like you put some money aside in case your car breaks. And that's the way it ought to be. I don't think that there, there wasn't medical insurance actually before World War II, and medical uh, insurance wasn't needed because the costs were lower. Uh, so, uh, no, the, the whole system has got to be washed away and changed at this point. And the government doing what it's trying to do now under Obama, it's only going to have the effect of cementing the poor people to the bottom of society by making them ever more reliant on the government and therefore less reliant on themselves. And it's going to put even more mandarins in charge of the national government, generally rich people, who are going to pay off their rich friends. So you're going to have increasingly in the United States uh, an upper class and a lower class. And the middle class, which is what made this country great, is going to increasingly disappear in the years to come. This is why I've said for some time that we shouldn't even call this political entity we live in America. America was a wonderful idea. It was a fantastic idea. But America is gone. It's disappeared. It's been replaced by the United States, which is just another of 200 political entities which cover the face of the earth like a skin disease at this point. I'm glad you don't have a strong opinion about it, Doug. Now, now Tom, uh, you mentioned a Nobel Prize, but I'm going to mention another one. Jim Buchanan, who won the Nobel Prize, I don't remember, sometime in the <clears throat> 90s, as I recall, wrote an article uh, not too many years ago um, about the idea of dependency, a my <clears throat> mindset. And so I guess my question is this. We, we, you can rail about government being bad and all that, but ultimately, it's, isn't it the individuals who decide that they want something from the government and then they go to their political leaders and get something? I mean, what, what role do we as individuals have in order to try to reduce this uh, leviathan that you don't care much about? Right. I mean, I, I, I don't care much for. I, I, I would say that um, you know, in, in a lot of the blame has to be placed on individual people themselves, in spite of the fact that we can mitigate this to the extent that people are educated in government-run schools, which by, isn't this an interesting coincidence, which teaches them that the government is their friend and it supplies them with free services and it defends them from their enemies and, and they get all these won this wonderful view of government, so of course they believe that we are the government and the government is just my servant and they believe all this nonsense that has nothing to do with the real world. But leaving aside the fact that they've been brainwashed into believing utter nonsense, it is still a fact that, as Albert J. Knox said, and as Franz Oppenheimer said, there are two ways to acquire wealth. I mean, you can, you can work for it, you can produce something that your fellow man wants, uh, you can produce some service, or you can steal it from them. I mean, that's basically it. Those are the two ways. Then they're mutually exclusive. You can, you can get it voluntarily, or you can steal it. And given that human beings prefer to get the things they want by means of the least possible exertion, well, they're going to 
prefer to take what Oppenheimer calls the political means of acquiring wealth rather than the economic means. That is, going to the government, getting the government to loot their neighbor. And I don't even mean necessarily, by the way, exclusively poor people. I'm talking about competitors who can't compete very well, so they file antitrust complaints against their competitors. Antitrust law, it's not like competitors, uh, pardon me, it's not like the general public says, I think this company is too big, I'm going to file a complaint. No, typically these companies are offering you bargains, low prices, the opposite of what government offers you. And, and um, it's the competitors that say, oh, I, you know, I can't compete with you. So typically what happens is people want to exert themselves as little as possible and they use the government to cripple their competitors or steal from people or in some illicit way that we would in any other context consider absolutely immoral. We consider this politics and compromise. Well, the, another economist <clears throat> who was born even before Doug and I were born, uh, Bastiat, I, mm. I, how do you pronounce his French name, but he wrote a little book called the law, and that's really, I think, what you're talking mm -hmm. about. So tell that viewer what he said back in the 19th century and, and why it's still so powerful today. Yeah, Bastiat wrote a, a tiny little book you can read online just simply called The Law. And it's one of these 50-page little tiny booklets that can change the, the, the way you think. But the main principle of the idea was that we have come to believe in what he calls legal plunder. Now, plunder is the idea that I can just go in like a pirate and just steal things from you, and that's the way I'm going to live. Well, we would consider that to be illegal plunder. Legal plunder is when we use the government to go take that thing, and suddenly that becomes the height of morality. So he says there are three ways we can organize society. Number one, everybody plunders everybody. Number two, some people plunder other people. Or number three, nobody plunders anybody. And for some reason, we consider number two to be the ideal, the height of morality, the only way human beings can interact with each other, and it's considered crazy extremism that you would even consider that there might be the humane alternative of nobody plundering anybody. Uh, Doug, I suppose that's probably the option you'd like to have too, isn't it? Yes, I, I believe in a civil society, and unfortunately the state contrary to all of its representations, creates uh, the opposite of a civil society. It, it becomes a war of all against all. The um, book that Albert J. Nock wrote called, uh, was it Our Enemy the State? Is that, is that what it is? And, and he, I think in that book he differentiates between the government and the state. Uh, give us some sense of, uh, you may not differentiate it at all. I don't know, Doug, do you or not? I'm not sure if I really make that distinction. Uh, look, as an anarchist, that's, I believe in an orderly society, but society self-orders itself. When you go into a restaurant, or for that matter, into a, a Walmart, uh, you don't need the government. The government provides no useful purpose in those, in those places. The owner of the restaurant maintains order there. The manager of the Walmart maintains order there. Uh, you don't need the state in, in those instances, and I, I can't think of any places where you actually need the state. So, and moreover, the state creates problems that it then blames on the private sector. So when its crummy price controls lead to shortages of meat in the 1940s, the president blames the farmers for hoarding the meat. And in fact, Truman actually considered sending out the army and the National Guard onto American farms to confiscate the meat that he was sure was being hoarded there. Or when prices rise, well, this is because of greedy labor unions and businessmen. Or when there's an economic collapse, such as we've endured, well, that's because uh, our wise government didn't regulate these people enough. Look, the whole system is screwed up. It is so screwed up that it doesn't matter how much you regulate it, that you will f people will find ways around it. When you have a system that has a Federal Reserve system that has proven itself willing and able to bail out any market actor that acts like an idiot, what do you think is going to happen? People are going to be more likely to act like idiots. You know, big surprise. And then we say, well, we just need a little more regulation. No, what we need to do is cut this awful root out that is encouraging this type of reckless behavior. And we also need to remember that the guys who graduate from business school and then go and become regulators, those weren't the brightest kids in, in business school. I guarantee you, the brightest kids don't become regulators. They go off and start businesses. So, you, in other words, the dumb kids are going to try and regulate the smart guys. If the system isn't sound, you can chase them around with regulations all you want, and you're not going to get what you want. It's, well, very, it's very funny relative to what Tom was just saying about Truman uh, accusing the farmers of hoarding, because just a few years before, Roosevelt was 
accusing the farmers of overproducing. So he was pouring milk in the gutter and slaughtering pigs. So yeah. what we're dealing with when we're dealing with politics uh, is a, a dramatization of people's psychological aberrations. And unfortunately, the kind of people that go into government are the kind of people that have the most aberrated psychologies. They're the kind of people that actually think they have a, a right to control what other people do and have and think. Is there any way out? I mean, how can we get from where, uh, where we are to where you'd like to be, or at least move the needle in that direction? Well, I'm afraid that as we speak now, we're in just the very early stages of what I call the Greater Depression. It's a period of time during which most people's standard of living, here in the United States anyway, are going to go down significantly. But it's also a time when distortions and misallocations of capital in the marketplace are liquidated. Uh, I think that in the next 10 years, we're going to see as great a change in American society as we had during the Depression and World War II. It's going to be a huge change. Now, how society is going to reorder itself that's up in the air. I hope it reorders itself with a much smaller state, a much smaller government, and much more individual freedom. It might go exactly the opposite way. OK, Tom, we just have a minute or so left. Um, uh, what's your prognostication, or at least a prescription, as to how we change this thing, if you'd like to see it changed to the, to the better from your standpoint? Well, I think the, the only mechanism available to almost anyone is, is just education, and that is, uh, that's a very thin read because, as I said, people want to get what they want with the least possible exertion. And if you say, hey, everybody, I'd like you all to read these five books, you might as well be speaking Chinese. So the best we can do is, is spread the word using the Internet, using all the means at our disposal to explain that what you've been told is basically a, a lot of bunk and that the people you're taught to admire and wave incense before are frankly parasites on the productive sector of the economy who are the real heroes of our society. But, but, I'm, but I've, I, I see right now a group of constituents who benefit I mean, th there's a huge percentage of this country with we're old, we got Social Security, if we're uh, our Medicare and that sort of thing. How do you get around that? <coughs> well, we, we realize that, that in the future, the, the young kids now aren't going to have anything. That the, the average 65-year-old is going to get about, you know, tens of thousands of more, $70,000 more than he put into the major transfer programs. The average 25-year-old is going to pay in about 300 grand more than he's ever going to get back. I mean, that's not sustainable either. So, I mean, something's got to be done, and we have to think about uh, what that might be. Last 15 seconds, Doug, are yours. <laughs> We're headed for very big trouble in this country over the next few years. It's, uh, it's uh, not going to be fun to, uh, to, to be here and be involved in this. So I'm spending more and more time out of the U.S. so I can watch this on my widescreen as opposed to out my front window because it's going to be potentially very catastrophic. Well, that's not a, a, a pretty picture. Uh, read. Uh Read Tom Woods' book here called Meltdown. That'd be a good thing for you to do. Read, uh, go online to Doug Casey. You'll find him all over the internet. Some of the stuff may even be true about what you read about Doug Casey. Doug, we appreciate your being here. Tom, we appreciate your being here too. We appreciate your joining us, where as always, we've been talking about things that matter with people who care. Visit our website at mcquistiantv.com to view and discuss past and present McQuistian TV episodes and subject matter. You can also follow McQuistian TV on Twitter at McQuistian TV or download McQuistian TV video podcasts on iTunes. A video or DVD of this program is available for $20 plus $5 postage and handling and in Texas applicable tax or call us at 214-442-1600 for more information on McQuistian. Production of McQuistion is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation for the Study of Teaching and Self-Government, the Meadows Foundation, serving the people of Dallas, Collin County Business Press, locally relevant, personally profitable, and Sundown Ranch, one sundown at a time.